And so can you paint the picture as to where you were in your life prior to group therapy and then what specifically the group really helped you work through? Sure. So when I started, right when I started, what had happened was it was this summer and I had just finished my first year of law school and I found out that I'd done really well and I, I was first in my class and I had a, a moment of euphoria and I was proud of myself because I'd worked really hard, but then immediately I crashed. And the reason I crashed is because I knew I had hidden in studying and the resume and the 4.0 and I was hiding because I had a secret and the secret was I didn't know how to do relationships. Mm -hmm. I'm talking friendships, romance, and I could tell, oh my gosh, I'm going to have this incredible career. I'm going to bill hours. Maybe I'll be a baller, but I'm not going to come home to anybody because I don't know how to do attachment. And I was so depressed by the disparity in my personal life versus my professional future and I didn't know how to fix it. I was a smart woman and I'd done a lot of things, but I couldn't fix that and I couldn't do it on my own and I didn't know what to do. And luckily someone suggested her therapist and people had suggested therapy to me before, but therapy is expensive and it's time consuming and it's scary. And I didn't know anything about it, but this final one that I took up, she said he does group and it's really cheap. <laughs> And when she told me the cost, it was $70 a session versus wow. 125. That's not that cheap, but it was cheaper. And I was willing to go because I could see a light in her eyes had come on since she started. And the price point was closer than what an individual session would have been. And I was willing to do it because I was in that much pain. Well, you bring up a great point. Just accessibility to therapy is such an important thing. And a lot of people do get priced out. But the great news is that group does exist. And it really helps a lot of people like yourself. So when you went in for the first time, you know, what do you remember the most about that first time in a session with everybody? What I remember is the physical feeling of tremors in my belly. It's like the same feeling I get when you get on a roller coaster and the safety bar comes down and it clanks and it's too late <laughs> you can't get out it was that kind of physical kind of like shaking and tremoring and feeling like who are these people what's going to happen they look so plain and so just you know lawyers doctors you know going to therapy before their day and i didn't know what was possible i didn't know what was going to happen so i was very afraid and i think some of that fear was excitement too it was very foreign. I was taking a new action. I was going to go somewhere different in my life because I was doing something new. I just didn't know what it would be. And I was really scared. It's hard to do a new thing, especially something like that. And the cool thing is like you did it for such a long time and continue to work on yourself. And I give you a ton of credit for that. But when did you start to see the growth, you know, in that relationship building and really just developing healthy relationships all across the board? Yeah, I think I would drop the pin the first moment when I realized I was doing something radical for myself, which was showing other people my mess, the things I'd worked so hard to hide. And it was early on, it was in the first few months when Dr. Rosen invited me to share what I'd eaten the day before with my group. And I never told anybody what I ate, how much, what time, what speed. And he was on to me and I felt so resistant. Hmm. And I knew that that resistance was gonna be important to break through because the eating was, it was a problem in my life. And the invitation to share was going to lessen, was gonna change it. It was, I didn't know it then, but it was gonna take away a lot of the shame. And I was gonna get an opportunity to see my group mates nod their heads and, sh and, and share their own eating dysfunction with me. And when I was able to tell the group what I ate, which was one of the hardest things I'd done to date, and I'd done a lot of hard things, but that was a big one. And then this follow-up suggestion was to every night, call one of the group mates and tell her what I'd eaten during the day. I knew I would do it. I knew it would be hard. And I understood on some intuitive level that doing this hard thing was the hard work of changing myself so I could be with people. Because I spent so much time hiding and putting on a show 
that's why I wasn't attached. And on some level, I knew that. That's a really amazing story because even just being asked the right question to say, what did you eat as opposed to share what's going on in your life? You're probably not going to answer in the same way. And also you mentioned the fact that other people are responding for you personally, when you got to hear from other people about their stuff and to see how they were doing and how they were growing, what did that do for you and just your overall personal experience and, and your own personal growth? That's absolutely life altering to me. I can't think of a time when I've gone into group and shared something scary or personal or shameful, be it sexual or eating or just my thoughts or how I love or who I want to love me. The nodding around the circle, and it may not be everyone, oftentimes some of my, some of my issues feel very gendered. Like when I went into group once and shared a story about how I felt about my breasts, which seems very countercultural, like I don't like them. <laughs> And I wish they would go away. And I, when I looked around the room and every single woman in my group was shaking her head and then shared a story about her relationship to her breasts and how it's mediated through a toxic culture and messages that come at us, I understood that we were all going to get well together and that I was never, ever asked to jump into the swimming pool by myself. They were already there swimming, my group mates, or they jumped in with me. And that kind of company made it possible for me to take these leaps and understand something about humanity and relationships that I don't know how else I could have gotten that. And we just have such an issue with judgment. You should just be able to share what's going on in your life. You should be able to share the mess, but you're afraid of what other people are going to think. So when you think about your own journey and even, you know, a, a larger picture here, how do we move past the shame and the judgment and just be more accepting overall where, you know, you could walk over to somebody and be like, hey, this is going on in my life. And. I'm just going to air it out here. That is such a great point. I feel really concerned about the way people are weaponizing shame and judgment. It seems like it's getting even worse. And when I think about well, what can I do about that and what my commitment is to sharing my own, my own shame and my own mess, and I surround my people, myself with people who are committed to that too, who believe in the liberatory power of telling the truth of showing the good the bad and the ugly and i don't participate in shaming other people and i don't i don't follow podcasts that do that because it's really pervasive right now and i think we can start to change the conversation when we own our own shame and i think even the work of brene brown and glennon doyle like we're starting to see more conversations about if I'm judging someone or if I'm, I'm tempted to, believe me, I'm not perfect at all, but I don't practice that publicly. I look at, I've been trained through group to look at myself. I feel shame about something. If I feel judgment, I most likely feel shame about my own behavior or something I'm seeing. And the work to do is my own. It's not for me to point out to other people what work they need to do. And the sooner we all get on our own sides of the street and clean up our own shame and our own messes, the more we're going to be able to connect without this pernicious judgment and finger pointing that's all over our culture right now. That's really beautifully said. And listen, this is a year where everybody's going through something. Everybody has stuff going on and they need somebody to ask them how they're doing. It's not just the strong people. It's not the weak people. It's everybody has something they need to talk about. So when you think about connecting with people during COVID-19, like we have to do this in a virtual way with Zoom, you know, what's most important to you right now? What's most important for other people if, if they feel like they don't have somebody in their life, if they feel like they want to get into therapy, you know, what are a couple of different things that people can kind of do to get the ball rolling in their own life? Well, one, one thing that you can check out now, group therapy has been around for 50 years, but it's starting to become a more prevalent, which my book just adds to that conversation. And there's a lot of organizations that are really committed to breaking down both the stigma and the additional barriers to therapy, including cost and accessibility. And in this time of the pandemic, when a lot of us can't meet in person, I do Zoom therapy and that's the prevailing thing that's happening. There are organizations that are creating groups that are over like telemedicine and you can check that out there. Um, there's an organization that's run by Dr. Nina Vassen and she's out of Stanford and she's got an organization called The Real and they've formed online groups and 
there's groups for all kinds of niche problems, so to speak, or if you're struggling with eating or addiction or incest or professional, you can find a group that's for yourself and you can do it online. And the nice thing about that is if you are scared and it's totally reasonable to be afraid to jump into a group situation, if you are, the mediation that comes from Zoom is might be a good way to dip your toe in. This might be the perfect time because you, they won't see your body and they won't, you, you can always click off your screen or whatever you need to do. But I think the mediation lends itself to a certain kind of, there's a barrier there obviously because of Zoom and that's perfect for someone who's really afraid to do this work in person with flesh and blood people. Well, Christy, I'm so glad that you did the work for yourself personally and I'm so happy people can read this. Thanks so much for joining us. Be well and we'll talk to you down the road, okay? Thanks so much. Take care of yourself too.